Less than a year ago, I celebrated what I thought was the election of a sceptical and liberal Conservative administration. And now I'm left wondering if the Prime Minister hasn't been abducted by Dr Strangelove and reprogrammed by the sage over to the dark side. The purpose of politicians is to impose a measure of um, proportion, a sense of proportion on science and not to be enthralled to it. Now, I will make myself very unpopular, but I believe that the appearance of the chiefs last week should have been a sacking offence. When they presented that graph, oh, with the caveat that it wasn't a prediction, but nevertheless, it was clear that they presented it as a plausible scenario, with its 50,000 cases per day by mid-October based on the doubling of infections by the week. Not once, not on one day since March, have there been infections on that day that were double that of the day of the week proceeding. Not once. Where did this doubling come from? What was their purpose in presenting such a graph? It was the purpose of the fat boy in Pickwick Papers. I want to make your flesh creep. It was project fear. It was an attempt to terrify the British people as if they haven't been terrified enough. Now, I've been banging on about this since March. And every criticism I've, been, I've made, I've been told that the government was relying on the best possible science. So I am delighted by the letter one week ago today, the nuanced criticism of Professors Hennigan, Gupta and Sikora. And I believe that it is now the government that has to answer that criticism. I'm glad that the consensus in the scientific community is broken and the critics are speaking out. I don't underestimate for one moment the horrible nature of this disease and its post-viral syndrome. But in terms of the United Kingdom's killers, it is 24th in the league, accounting, to only one, accounting for only 1.4 of us. And as a consequence, I believe that the government's policy has been disproportionate. By decree, it has interfered in our private lives and our family lives, telling who we may meet, when we may meet them, and what we must wear when we meet them. We have the cruelty, the cruelty of elderly people in care homes, disoriented, being unable to see the faces of their loved ones and to receive a hug. We have the tsunami of deaths that we may, we may uh, experience shortly as a consequence of undiagnosed cancers and heart disease and the discontinuation of clinical trials. I give away to my right honourable friend. Friend looked at the advice given to the Swedish government and the different policies they followed and what does he deduce from that? I, I deduce that they, that was much more proportionate. Of course, all sorts of criticisms are levied against the Swedish government that on examination of the data and comparing like for like actually are, are without, without foundation. I, I certainly uh, hold up the Swedish model as an alternative. The, we have seen the eye-watering costs that we must now all face for a generation uh, having closed down our economy for uh, the, all those months as a consequence of the government's policy. The, the crushing of enterprises, the, um, the, 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 the destruction of livelihoods, the, 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 the unemployment that we're going to have to face now amongst young people, all as a consequence of an overaction. I understand now there's some question as to whether students are to be allowed to return from university at Christmas. Can I say most gently to my honourable friend on the front bench that the last administration that sought to restrain celebrations at Christmas was during the Commonwealth, when the Lord Protector, as a consequence, was left musing in public as to whether if he were to arm one in ten, that would be enough. 
how many marshals will be required. I conclude by saying that the policy of the government has been disproportionate in response to this threat. There may, Madam Deputy Speaker, be a, a virus one day that threatens our very way of life. But this isn't it, even if we're behaving as if it were. So Desmond's right. Mr Deputy Speaker, we've made the case against the regulations in this House and we've lost all the votes. And that's democracy. But liberal Western democracy is more than ruled by the majority. It certainly includes freedom of association, freedom of expression, freedom to worship. And one of the most worrying aspects of our response to coronavirus has been the way that people have simply shrugged as these freedoms have been dispensed with. And the government has armed itself with all the coercive powers of the state to tell us who we may meet, when we will meet them, where we may meet them, what we must wear. Freedom of protest has been dispensed with, as has freedom of worship. And isn't it interesting the way that subsidiaries of the totalitarian state, in their eagerness, seek to exceed even that which has been proscribed and prescribed? I've received representations from clinicians who have been threatened that their jobs will be taken from them because they have publicly expressed their doubts about the wisdom of the policy or indeed their doubts about the misuse or the concealment of data. We had that extraordinary scene of a nurse being charged with assault for seeking to liberate her mother from a care home. Could this have happened in our country? And then we saw those students seeking to effect a great escape from the Stalag Luft three that their university had imposed upon them. And as these enormities occur, instead of the expected rising chorus of protest, on the contrary, we're told by the pollsters that actually the British people thirst for even greater restraints on their liberty. I am appalled, absolutely appalled. These liberties, as we heard in the debate earlier this afternoon, were bought at an extraordinarily high price. So now, as we move into the vaccinated sunny uplands of release and freedom, there is a danger that the state has learnt a powerful lesson over the last few months. Namely, that the British people don't worry too much about their liberties and that they can be dispensed with conveniently when need arises. I hope that this House will wake up to that danger and seek a remedy. Bill Esterson. Sir Desmond Swain. Why will you be able to buy a pint in a sports venue without getting anything to eat? But if you order a pint in a pub, you'll have to have a substantial meal. I'll leave that hanging as the great existential question of the day. Madam Deputy Speaker, suppression in anticipation of vaccination is the reason for these measures before us today. But people have been writing to me for months, terrified that a vaccine will be compulsory. And I've responded by saying, don't be so absolutely ridiculous. It could never possibly happen. We're a conservative government, after all. And now we discover, now we discover that a vaccination may be a passport to the acquisition of your civil liberty, liberties, yeah, yeah, yeah. and without which you will have all sorts of things that you would be able to do denied to you. Can I say that that would be absolutely disproportionate oh, yeah. to a, a virus with a mortality rate of verging on 1%. It would equally be a terrible precedent, precedent to set for other vaccines and medicines. Uh, so, I hope 
that we can get away from that. The way to persuade people to have a vaccine is, of course, to line up the entire government and its ministers and their loved ones and let them take it first and then get all the lovies, the icons of popular culture, out on the airwaves singing its praises. To have any kind of suggestion of coercion absolutely feeds the conspiracy theory that we are being cowed and our liberties being taken away. Very I'm busy. extremely grateful to him for giving way. It, will he agree with me that it's not enough for the government merely to refrain from coercing people? The government's also got to pay attention to implicit coercion. That is, if the government turns a blind eye to allowing businesses like airlines and restaurants to refuse to let people in unless they've had the vaccination. The government's got to decide whether it's willing to allow people to discriminate on that basis. Discrimination. It would be vaccinationism, which we must, of course, resist. The other thing that any kind of coercion would do would be to set the seal on this government's reputation as the most authoritarian since the Commonwealth of the 1650s. But it is as nothing to the enthusiasm that we've seen from the front bench opposite for even more coercive and restrictive measures. Sammy Wilson. Again, the Madam Deputy Speaker, hard to follow the last speaker for New Forest West. But can I say that, first of all, as a Northern Ireland member, people may say, well, what input do you have on a debate? which is about restrictions in England. The truth of the matter is, of course, that whatever restrictions are introduced in England tend to be replicated and indeed sometimes magnified by the Health Minister in Northern Ireland. And let me just give one example. In my own constituency, the lovely Carnfunnock Park, I could go for a walk through it today with a golf bag over my shoulder. But if I dodged through the hedge into the golf course next door, I'd be breaking the law because the law was introduced here that golf would be, if you played golf, you'd somehow kill some of the population, so therefore you couldn't do it. And uh, so the 